This is the Nomad Futurist Podcast, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and transformation. Connect with us, share your thoughts with us at nomadfuturist.com. Let's get this started. Here are Phil and Nabil. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Nomad Futurist Podcast. This is your host, Nabil Mahmood from Kona, Hawaii. This is Phil, your co-host from Brooklyn, New York. And this is uh, Cole Crawford, currently from Aspen, Colorado. Cole, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Let's start with your background, who you are, what you do, and how you got to where you're at in your career. Yeah, man. I mean, how much time do I have for the podcast here? Um, t- technically, I-, I walked into my uh, my little brother's room. He had a friend there, and they had this blue screen, and I was sure that it was like a, a Windows machine gone wrong, right? The blue screen of death. Happened to be Linux installer. From that day on, I was I was hooked on I was hooked on Linux. I was hooked on open source. Ended up working for an ISP, which if you uh, have any cred at all in this industry, you worked at an ISP in the late 90s. Uh, so I checked that box. Um, ended up well, what now looks to be kind of structured was actually a super meandering path through a career that I had no plan for. Ended up in uh, at US West, which was one of the baby bells, went to the Quest acquisition, uh, went to work for Dell, did some really cool top secret work for the government as a DOD contractor, co-founded this little thing called OpenStack and Open Compute, Open 19, and started Vapor. And so here we are. All right. Quick question. I'm going to try to get some context in there. How old were you when you walked into your little brother's room? I was 15. 15 years old. 15, okay. 15. So. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you, so if you want, I'll tell you the story. It's actually really, it has nothing to do with tech. No, perfect. So, okay. Uh, obviously, everyone everyone is familiar with Scientology. And I, I bet you didn't think I was going there. So everyone's familiar with Scientology. Tom Cruise, I hope you're nope. listening. Uh, I'm actually one rem- one one person removed from Tom Cruise. This this hat that I'm wearing, Bo Bridges, he, uh, if you go to his website, he, he did some stuff with Tom Cruise. But anyway, um, if, you, if you're, you, most people are familiar with that, what lesser known is there is a, a kind of a spoof on Scientology called Church of the Subgenius. Church of the Subgenius, um, the uh, sort of it's not it's not a real religion, right? It's uh, it's a, it's kind of a spoof of a of a religion. Uh, but the idea of Church of the Subgenius is to create something called Slack, and Slack is like goodwill, you know, towards everybody. And a guy named Patrick Volkerding created Slackware, which is actually the first Linux distribution ever. And so I walked into my brother's room and I was a big Church of the Subgenius fan. And I was at the time, probably again, too much information. But at the time, I was uh, just starting to enter my way into this massive like uh, blunder years of, of gothness uh, for about a decade. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I was very young when I when I got into tech, you know, sort of the antisocial uh, you know, competitive tennis kid goes rogue and ends up wearing black for a decade. But uh, I, I, I loved the I loved the premise of the operating system. I really liked the the democratized way in which um, they wanted to, to to ship that that um, OS out. And uh, at, you know, at the time it was it was um, like Windows 3.11, and that was terrible. So I wanted just anything else. All right, so Linux was your religion. That's what I pulled from that. It was 100%. I mean, it was for many, for a decade it was. Yeah. I mean, I, I ended up as the cloud advisor to the Linux foundation before there was ever a cloud. Oh my God. Linus, Linus is your God. I got Man, to intro, Linus. I got, so at a, at a Linux foundation event in Japan, I got to intro Linus Torvalds and yeah, that, that may have been, you know, <laughs> that, that may have been one of, one of the highlights of my life as I, as I look back, maybe. You must have a Linus tattoo. I know we talked about having like a Nomad Futurist <laughs> tattoo, but you must have a Linus tattoo. Yeah, um, you, you, I can't set, tell you where it is though. So did you, um, did you like go to school for technology? Like you were 15 years old. Obviously you, there was no, you, you weren't uh, yet out of, I don't know, what is it, high school? I don't even, I, I'm so yeah. far removed from that age. I can't even tell. Yeah, um, I, I I went to high school. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, so, not, <laughs> but but is that like did you did you decide to pursue a from that moment a career in engineering? No, uh, I was actually a very competitive tennis player. The 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 only competitive golf tennis player you'd ever you'd ever uh, get to meet. Um, 
I, I was a nationally ranked tennis player growing up, um, and I was sure I was going to end up as a pro tennis player. Uh, but best laid plans. Um, sure. I ended up, you know, sort of trying to be uh, a, a pro tennis player in Florida. Um, was was going to night school. Uh, well, I was going to school and I was working the night shift. Sorry, at, at America Online, and I just decided to uh, just just go all in on tech and. You know, while I was going to school, I just, it, my, I knew more than my teachers. You know, I was, I'd been working with Linux for, for, you know, five, six years by then. So I felt like I didn't need a formal education, especially taught by people that knew less than I did. So I just, uh, I just quit. I just quit school and went all in on tech. So knowing more than your teachers was the turning point for you then? I mean, I've always been sort of a, you know, egocentric kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> probably too full of himself so maybe that was maybe that was not the right move but yeah well you can't become a ranked tennis player without having uh you know a significant amount of self-confidence in those shots i it, it led to very few friends so, so what, why did you end up quitting tennis uh so i mean look i i, I tried i had you know in, in tennis you 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 uh, everyone has the same shots you know when you get to a certain level you've got the same forehand the same backhand same serves like you you know various aspects of your game what's different is sort of your you know physical conditioning and your but even more importantly than that is your stat is your mental stamina tennis is not a you versus them it's a you versus you game um and you know i was uh i was probably an order of magnitude worse than john McEnroe in terms of attitude so that's that was the career limiting tennis fact for for me. McEnroe has met his match emotionally. Yeah, at least. Uh, emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout this journey, what do you think is the the most interesting or unique skill that you've developed besides that? Uh, my 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 well, my interpersonal skills have gotten a lot better. So uh, uh, I actually yeah no uh, the skill. So you know what's what's interesting about starting a career when you when you don't have a degree is. Um, a, you better, you better technically better be able to back up what you say. Um, but also, you know, you end up being able to, I, I would, I would think you would be in a, a situation where you'd have to be really good at contextualizing, contextualizing a lot of different problems and bringing those together to, you know, some kind of harmonized solution. And so I think that's always, yeah, look, entrepreneurs are contrarian by default. They're always looking at something from a different angle. And I think innovating against that, um, there's a skill associated with looking at something and saying, how can it be done better? Um, you know, and sometimes the best inventions in, in, in the world have, have come from people that were not in that field, right? They came to that field recently and they just looked at it very differently. Um, and so I think, you know, I think pattern matching and, uh, contextualizing disparate problems and trying to build solutions towards those problems is probably, probably my, you know what I've what I've learned uh, uh, and 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 sort of I think personally taken care of in terms of what skill I'd I'd like to grow you know aside from being a good boss um, which uh, also took some learning. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna have to start interviewing some of the Vaporio staff to see to see how true that is, but. You know, it's interesting. I, I also, you know, started my career in kind of this entrepreneurial way. And, um, you know, we're in a field that is kind of difficult to describe to anyone outside yeah. of that field. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I always used to say when somebody asked me what I did, not to try to sound like a hitman or anything, is I'm a problem solver. Um, yeah. and, and I think in general, that's what all um, kind of our generation of, of people had to be because there were no clear solutions to the problem. We were, kind, right. we kind of invented, uh, the industry started while we were, you know, coming of That's age. Right. So uh, there were no solution to those problems. You, you very much had to find them. So you had to be, you had to have that mind to just, you know, not try to look to a book or to a teacher for how to solve a problem, but recognize that, um, you know, you had to kind of um, pave your own way. Hundred percent, right? And when I was going to school, the the the, the computer science um, languages were like COBOL and Fortran, and yeah. you know, if I would have stayed with that, I mean, I'd be a great mainframe developer today. But you know, uh, d distributed systems and kind of the cloud native world that we're all living in now, you know, something tells me I probably made the right bet. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but but I, you know, my my wife is uh, four years younger than me, and and she is 
uh, adamant that I am Gen X and she is a millennial, but I think we are both zennials. I don't know if you guys have heard of this micro generation where you had an analog childhood, but you had a digital adulthood. And so I right. clump us together to make me feel better about myself sure. um, that I'm not four years older than my wife. But, uh, um, you know, you're absolutely right. When we were like the Internet was built with, you know, our generation built the Internet. Uh, well, I mean, technically, like 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 Vince Cerf and <laughs> those guys built the, built the I internet. Can't, I can't believe you think you're the same generation as Vince Cerf. <laughs> uh, I, you know, one I've got one foot in the grave anyway. <laughs> gotcha. Sorry, Vin. Yo, Vin, we're 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 happy you're healthy, man. <laughs> actually, yeah. I, I so I actually have met Vin, and man, that that guy. There's there's few people that I'm just like mentally just intimidated by. Uh, because they're so much smarter than me, and Vent is one of those guys. He's, he's awesome. Got like he's, huge, awesome. he's got a huge temple, so it's he's an intimidating character. You know, kind of like the evil guy from uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I, you know, it, yeah, yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Oh man, you're totally. never getting funding. Again. Shredder, Vent, you're never Vent Shredder. <laughs> Shredder. Um, uh, you know, the uh, it, that's a, it's an interesting point. The, the Zennial point is an interesting one because you know I remember. Um, I don't know if it was earlier this year or maybe late last year, they had that video where they take like, uh, like a, a 12 year old or, or a 13 year old and try to have them make a phone call with a rotary phone and yeah. they just can't do it. They can't yeah. do it because they can't get yeah. through the number. They can't memorize. They don't know how to delete. They don't need this to do. Um, yeah. so, you know, there's, there's a notion of because you didn't have that, because the, this current generation didn't have that kind of analog upbringing, they're just inherently, you know, they know how everything works really well. This is a, a common theme on, on the podcast that I bring up, but they don't necessarily know why it works because they don't need to know why it works because yeah, it just exactly. it's just magic. You know, it's just there and they take for granted the fact that it exists. And when you're a, you know, Linux systems administrator, um, that's just kind of coming along with, you know, a an operating system as it's being created, you're involved in, you know, trying to get a kernel to work uh, with hardware and, you know, yep. you talk about, everyone talks about this cloud first kind of methodology and everything being orchestrated and all that stuff. But, you know, the people that are getting, um, you know, engineering jobs today, systems administration jobs today, they look to infrastructure as being, you know, whatever AWS, whatever Amazon tells them the infrastructure okay. is, like interface okay. becomes their, their, you know, crutch. Um, and it's really, I mean, to me, not having that full throated understanding of the fact that there's actually a board that software has to interact with, uh, in order to function, uh, effectively is it's, it's a lost art. And I'm not sure that, you know, it's necessarily coming back, but, um, you know, it's, it's something that should, should be understood, I think, for, by the next generation and all of the like top people in engineering, the top people that excel, um, in, in systems engineering or, or, or um, you know, infrastructure engineering, et cetera, have that at least appreciation for the fact that at, there is an underlying piece of hardware beyond all of the, you know, kind of software interfaces. Uh, totally agree with you. Um, you know, some, something about those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, you know, we, we, we want open and democratized access, but if you don't care and you're given a, an interface that is built for you, you're never going to fully understand it. Um, and I, you know, I think, yeah, if you, if you've ever had to manufacture your own aspirin, which is very much like what happened in the early days of Linux, you know, I, one of the most rewarding things I can, I can think back through, you know, sort of 25 years of IT. And one of the most re rewarding things that I still think back to today is successfully compiling a kernel that accepted my Sound Blaster card. And I did that and it felt so good because I got audio, you know, and I built that. Like that, is Creative, that was Labs, that is I, Creative Labs still in business? I don't, I don't think know. so. Oh my no, God. I, I used to love those I things. things. I love those. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. 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 it's like built in. So as a stance today, do you think we're actually doing that for the next generation whereby we're teaching the foundation of computing and infrastructure? I don't think that, and again, you know, I, I, I um, you know, while I've been fortunate enough to, you know, have been a, a guest lecturer at, at Notre Dame and, you know, other colleges, um, I, I think that we've, maybe the pendulum of IT has swung too far the other direction where we only look at abstraction interfaces and we're writing to, you know, APIs that just do all of the hard work for you. Um, it's, it's important 
it's important to understand the lower levels of a system. And this is actually, this comes into the edge. Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of really smart people out there that are network engineers, even on the wireline side uh, or the wireless side that think they know exactly how the internet works. But if I told them that from Austin, Texas, where I actually live, if I had to go to a generalized URL, um, with the protocols on the telco side and 4G that I'm making a trip from Austin to St. Louis, St. Louis to Atlanta, Atlanta to San Jose, where the data center is for that big company back to Austin. If I told them that's how the internet actually worked, they would not believe me. Say, no, it can't be that bad. And it is that bad. Like the internet routing that we use today, it's, it's, we, 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 we use BGP. BGP itself is a is a you know 25 year old protocol. I mean, it's a really old protocol, and it's what's propping up the internet today. And you know we're mechanically turking that. And if you're going to solve it at some level, you need to know what you're solving because you don't algorithmically you don't build an abstraction layer for the speed of light. At some point, physics come into play for the experiences you're going to have and the amount of fiber in the ground that you're going to traverse to go back to the internet. So I think a fundamental understanding of at least the problem, you may not know, need to know, you know every layer of it, but you need to know why it's broken. So in your opinion and your experience, what is the best way to educate people and, and the younger generation that's getting into the space to potentially solve this problem and save the rest of all the challenges uh, that are forthcoming? It's a super good question. And, you know, it really depends on on what age group, um, you know, but I think at some point, if, if you're going to if you're going to get someone excited about critical infrastructure or data centers at some point, that can't be Minecraft led. And what I mean by that is, you know, tactile interfaces are good interfaces to have experience with if you're going to touch, you know, high, high powered, like high voltage stuff at some point in the future. Um, all of the STEM programs that are in place uh, through elementary, middle, high school, et cetera, I think those are great things to think through. A lot of the robotics uh, competitions that are happening, I think are really cool. I just finished watching over the weekend. Um, are you guys familiar with DEF CON? You guys must be familiar with DEF CON. They just did a Hackasat thing with the US government, which is really, really neat. Um, and it was about uh, you know, bringing together this, this sort of white hat hacker community with the DOD trying to hack this satellite to, to do certain things, take control of it, et cetera. And I think those types of things um, are things that we need to continue investing in because I do believe that uh, the pendulum of IT or, or, or OT, as, as you know, we kind of think of ourselves in, in data center land, the operational technology side, um, I think you go through waves of, of, you know, I don't know if it's the right adjective, but I think right now infrastructure is sexy. Um, you know, you have, you have initiatives like open compute, which I'm very thankful to be a part of and open 19, which I'm very thankful to have, have been a part of, um, there, you know, there are ways there's just something so satisfactory about increasing the pace of innovation while democratizing, you know, access to data, um, and lowering the, the barrier of entry, whether that barrier of entry is economic or technical, um, making sure that kids have access to the, the, the guts of something. Um, I think that's really important to continue to sort of pique their curiosity. And I also believe, and man, now I feel like I'm on the soapbox, but... Um, Preach, Brother Cole. Dude, Preach. Dude, dude, dudes, I'm talking to the dudes out there. You, you know, stop, stop, stop limiting women. Like, like be nice to people, be a good human being. And, you know, the best governments in the world are run by a mix of a healthy mix of men and women. That can be true for IT and, and data centers. You know how few women. I actually think that, I actually think that the, the, the healthiest ones are, are run uh, by the majority of women. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, think sense, the, I think the healthy mix is like 70, 30 women. I, I just said healthy mix. I didn't say what, I didn't say 50, 50 men. Um, but. Uh, you absolutely could be right. Uh, and and it's sad to me that so few females choose IT or data centers as a career because they bring so, you know, women are better 
out of box thinkers than men. Like just in general, I think, you know, women are probably better contextualized thinkers. Maybe that's a gray matter, white matter thing with their brains, but um, we need more women in this, in this industry. And we're, and men are so good at weeding them out and making them quit um, and doing something else. And that's got to stop. One, one, one thing I, I just wanted to bring up is this notion that, um, you know, I think traditionally people think of computing and they think of computer engineering and, and, and our world as, you know, these guys that are, that are, that are in the basements with their little lab coats on and, you know, playing with, with computer gear and, you know, what we've seen, um, and it's accelerated obviously in the last several months is that there is no element of society that isn't touched by technology. So the notion that it's just this select few that need to have that underlying knowledge yep. Or yep. a select few that need to understand the way you know the internet works or technology works is ridiculous because there's not an element of our world. You can, I, we see it now, and we we had a storm last week in in the tri-state area that knocked out power across Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. And you know, for an extended period of time, some people still don't have power back a week later, and it's just. People are just fleeing their vacation homes, you know, which is just, you know, is problematic in and of themselves. As I speak to someone that's in Aspen, Colorado, um, as you hear my kids screaming behind me, my God, um, this is the new world we live in. Um, but there's just, they, they, everyone just freaks out if they don't have connectivity, you know, for a, for a moment. Um, yeah. So just this notion that, you know, they can they can be in this blissful ignorance and just think that, you know, it's not their problem how technology works and it doesn't impact them because, you know, they are not strictly technologists is yep. ludicrous. Everyone is now a technologist. Everyone is running a mission critical operation within their home. That's correct. And, and you know, as consumers, we don't know what we don't know. I mean, unless we unless we're us and we do know. But you know, every time you adjust your Nest thermostat, every time that you order an Uber, not that many people are you know, trying to go places right now, but um, every aspect of how you interface with your smartphone, there is a, there is a most likely there is a hyperscale cloud provider giving you that app experience. Very likely, right? 95% of, I mean, I'm just going to like go through my phone here and just look at some of these icons. And as I look at my icons, yeah, over 90% of everything I'm looking at is run either by a gigantic first party company or it's sitting in a in an AWS or an Azure or a Google Cloud or an IBM Cloud or something. Um, and we take that stuff for granted. The problem is, you know, think about when the electrical grid came about. And in the, in the, in the, you know, back in the World Fair days, um, and you sort of had, you know, Edison and Westinghouse and, and Nikola Tesla like battling out AC versus DC. We've had, we've had a century to improve electrical grids. We've had, what, 30 years to innovate around a better internet? You know, we're a third of the way into that journey. And, and our, our, our grids, you know, I typically, now, you know, your case around the Northeast is really interesting. Um, but typically, I think humans have a high level of confidence that, that when they enter a room and they flip that switch, the light's going to come on. And we've gotten pretty good at building resilient electrical grids. We're actually really bad at building resilient internet applications. Even today, we're really bad at it. Um, case in point, there was a massive outage that I, it affected me um, with a telco just a couple of weeks ago. Like big telco, one route, one route config push, and the telco was out. Get this big vast internet and millions of people out of out of service. So the internet, I think, has a long way to go before it's as ubiquitous as our electrical grids. That's really generous of you to to say that the electric grid is that great. Probably in the United States it is, and probably That's true. ninety to ninety five percent of the time is availability. Uh, That's true. Depending on where you're at as well. I mean, if you're in that, remote areas, you're going to struggle. Uh, which is which is 100 percent true. And actually, what I what I would offer there is that internet should be in a better place than electrical grid because the electrical grid there's current, right? You've got you've got current, and current isn't necessarily point to multi point. You don't route that, right? You don't route electrons. You can route photons. And so we, we're starting at a better place. But think about the bi-directional goodness that would come if even microgrids were able to pull 
power from one another. If you had a link between them and, you know, you had renewable energies from a microgrid that was able to borrow from your, 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 na your neighborhood adjacent to you. Um, yeah, I'm not saying by any means that, that, that um, um, centralized electrical grids are the panacea of where we need to be. Uh, point to multi-point photons or electrons well, electrons would always be point to point, but um, you get my drift. There's the internet starts at a better place because we can route photons and we can move data from one place to another. So we should be, in my view, better than we are today. I don't, I don't you know, it's, we have no excuse. Absolutely. So what do you think is the root cause analysis for this? Based on the previous podcast and people that we have talked to, it really comes down to the human element. It's the old guard that's actually very reserved, very territorial, not letting the information out, not letting the new generation come into play. And, and, and the, the point that earlier you brought earlier as far as women in this place is concerned. Um, besides that, what do you think is the, is the root cause for it? I, I mean, I, 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 man, this is where, where this is where my ego gets in in the way. Um, I think Bring I know on. what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, want, I, I want, I want, I want you to go full macaroni. Yeah. Let's go full macaroni. Yeah. 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 Well, I get so frustrated, right? Because, and I remember sitting. I was, I was, uh, I was at Dell at the time. This was probably two thousand eight, um, and I was, I was, an advisor to one of the largest. Um, Linux operating system companies. And I got there because of my seat at Dell, not because I'm a super Linux genius. Um, um, and we were talking about libraries. And this is a very boring thing for most people. We were talking about Linux libraries and the location of those libraries on the operating system. And I just said, why can't it be the same as this other operating system that's even a little bit bigger than you? And they said, well, then where would our differentiation come from? I mean, and that was so frustrating to hear. And then, right, you know, fast forward to like open compute and we're trying to get, you know, the biggest OEMs and the biggest ODMs on the planet to like just standardize on a pinout for a, the, the, the interface between the plastic of a power supply and the pinout on a motherboard. And the biggest companies in the world can't agree that on, a, on a pinout. How is that differentiating for anything other than it's differentiating? Like it, there's no technical reason it should be differentiated. It's just a, who has a better supply chain or who has, you know, more buying power. And those are the wrong things to differentiate on. I've always, you know, part of the reason I've, I've, I've been a fan of, of Linux and, and open ecosystems is <clears throat> I believe that differentiation should come in the form of a service, not in the differentiation of an interface. Um, and we differentiate on interfaces. I mean, the reality is in critical infrastructure, you know, and hell, I'll name names, right? Um, you, you buy a, a UPS from Eaton, you buy a UPS from Liebert, you buy a UPS from Vertiv, you buy a UPS from Schneider, you're going to have the same CAN bus, right? You're going to have the same binary router protocol that like kind of does uh, the, the register lookup for all of those things, but they're all in different places. That's all, you know, it's all, it's all in different places. There's nothing standardized about any of this. Um, but that obfuscation is where the, where the money comes from, right? The 100% it is. Right? So, it's and, the, and, you it's know, the it's maintenance between, contracts. It's closed yeah. source versus open source. I mean, it's the classic argument um, uh, for years, uh, which is why yeah. I'm sure you were thrilled when IBM bought Red Hat. Okay. For those of uh, the listeners that are not into IT and not, not, not necessarily know about Word of Eat and, and, and so on and so forth, the difference hereby really is buying a Lexus or a Toyota comes from the same bloody plant. It's as simple as that. That's that's exactly right. And and you know the paint color and the the interior might be a little you know a little bit different, but at the end of the day, it's the it's the it's basically the same stuff. And and look, I, I get it. These are huge companies, and I'm not here to say which UPS is better. I, I'm just like I'm just asking the question: Why why do I need? three service contracts across three companies to, to do the same function. Like it makes money for them, but it makes my job harder. Let's switch gears a little bit. You are certainly in a position where you started your company doing very well for yourself, uh, leading the way you are involved in educating people in the younger generation, knowing what we know of you right now, what would you have done differently if you were to go back in time? Oh man, I would have, I would have, I would have become a nicer person sooner. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I mean, to, to, to answer your question, honestly, not that that wasn't honest, but, um, 
you know, I look it back in the nineties when you worked for an ISP and you, you know, we didn't have in the earliest days, we didn't have EIA racks. We didn't have 19 inch racks that you mounted stuff in. We had compact computers and you built home Depot like towers for you built shelves and you put that stuff on shelves. You kind of did it all. And I feel like so many people in our, in our generation, um, that, kind of had to do that you know i mean i was at night i was i was cabling up computers and i was configuring routes and i was you know administrating linux and i mean you did everything and so i think you get the sense that you should do everything the reality is now though that the world is so big and i don't mean to the world, I mean, yeah, it's big, but the the technological world is so big and so vast. Um, there is no chance, no chance you could pick the big, biggest and best hyperscale cloud companies in the world. And there's no chance that they own anywhere near 100% of all the subject matter expertise across every aspect of the internet. I, I If I could do it all over again, I would have sought help sooner from other people. I would have saved myself a ton of pain. The pace of innovation for the things we were working on um, would have would have sped up and the world would have been a better place for it. And I think that that's something that everybody could sort of take to heart is that, you know, by by everything gets democratized over time anyway. Like think about the, the Vostok, you know, the Russian like first person into space. We had a, like a sp- you know, we had a space race over like who could get there first. And now like 20 something countries are like building the international space station together. We're all like contributing to the goodness of, of, of space exploration. Everything will get democratized over time. Um, just get there sooner. Just agree that you can, you know, you can collaborate in the open and you can differentiate on, on service and capability and it doesn't have to be on an interface. And that's what I'd say. Like, Find people who think like you and make friends with them and see how you can help them and see how they can help you. And that's that's what I would have done different. I think it's an amazing point. You know, I think in, in, in general, um, human nature is it, it, it comes with a fear of exposing what you don't know. So you have to kind of pretend to be an expert. Um, and it's always this kind of sizing up. It's it's, it's, it's maybe acute in in technology, but I think it's it, it goes across every vertical, and 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 and, um, and it's just it's something that you have to kind of experience it in order to to um, to understand how to come out of it. So yes, if you could go back and change that thing, change change the certain elements of it, you probably would. But it probably would have impacted who you are today and how open you are to uh, to to enlisting you know the help of others. Um, and I think as as you know a leader uh, in in the organization, that's something that you can kind of instill culturally within your organization, so you don't kind of compartmentalize you know the different elements of of, of what you guys do, um, and and have people not want to you know interact for fear of you know having somebody take credit or, or you know uh, those types of things. Yeah, I look. I think you're right. Um, though you know, I would say there's a fine line between. Um, being opinionated about what you think you know and being open to to someone else's ideas in in any given you know subject. Um, uh, there's a certain amount of, as as you know, there's a certain amount of grit that go and perseverance that goes into starting up anything Um, because there's a lot of people out there that want you to fail there's a lot of people that will deny what you are doing is even the right thing to do but if it is so blindingly obvious to you that you should do it you need to do it but there's ways in which you can you can get there faster and with with you know sort of less blockers um, by i guess you know seeking to understand and then be understood Whereas, you know, so, so many times, like I would approach something and I mean, I remember at US West, um, I was known as the dude, you're wrong guy. That was, that was me, dude, you're wrong. Um, And, you know, that's, that's not, I don't wear that sort of with a badge of honor. Like, I feel like I could, you know, a little bit of reflection and a little bit of uh, an attempt on my part to understand where they were coming from. And I'd probably be better off for it today because I'd probably understand even more. You know, Lord Lord Kelvin said to measure is to know. If you can't measure it, you can't know it. And if you can know more, then you can contextualize more. And that's probably good if you're a pattern matcher or a problem solver. 
Oh my God, that might have been our first Lord Kelvin uh, reference in the history of uh, of the podcast. Thank you, man. Thank you. Let's switch gears a little bit. COVID nineteen. We've been stuck in this catastrophe since March. Uh, what March of twenty ten? Right. It's been years, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it feels that way, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I'm actually, I'm actually eighteen years old. I've just aged. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 day is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? It's uh, yeah, it's Groundhog Day. Don't even know what time it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> What, what does post COVID nineteen normal state look like to you? I, you know, if I man, it's what's such a weird crystal ball, and 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 this 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 timeline, you know, who knows? Like, I feel like, uh, you know, Doctor Strange, we're in one of the we're one of the bad bad timelines where like Thanos like won, um, and this was part of it, but. Uh, um, I don't know. I, like where where we are technically versus where we are as a society. I think we're going to be in. I think we're going to be in different places on both fronts. My hope, and you know, I I, I did a, 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 a an interview earlier where this subject came up, um, and they you know the question was asked, did you benefit? You know, does vapor benefit from COVID nineteen? And you know what a and and the answer is we do, but but what a terrible reason, you know, COVID like, like that's, you know, COVID's not a the pandemic is not why I'd want to sort of benefit as a company. But when you're trying to put the internet in more places, more internet in more places, that's a good thing for the experiences that we're having right now. You know, if you can ease congestion on routes, if you can, if you can eliminate backhaul and you can automate um, interfaces that, you know, you don't necessarily have to put a human or two humans within proximity of each other. I think the automation of the internet and what's happening um, through, you know, network virtualization, infrastructure virtualization, and via vapor, um, OT, uh, you know, uh, operational technology virtualization, I think that I think that those are good things that, that will benefit just our industry in general. Um, and I'd like to think that there's a little bit of commoditization and democratization that 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 vapor sort of leading with some of the open source stuff that we've 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 done and and that's and by the way it's open source it's free 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 so there's there's no money to be made I just believe interfaces should be democratized as a society um, I think that um, I think I don't know if we're ever shaking hands again. I mean, I've never liked shaking hands. I, you know, I spent a little bit of time in Japan, and I loved that. That was a very cool, that was a very cool culture to experience. Um, you know, I was very happy when I found out that I did not have to, and this was earlier in my career, um, I didn't have to be the booth person anymore that had to go like shake the hands. Um, uh, you just out of view is, you know, m my hand sanitizer and the sort of weird fact around that is I've always had hand sanitizer next to me. Um, that's not been like a pandemic related thing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we're going to be I think we're going to be smarter. I think we'll be hopefully for some amount of time. Um, I hope that we're going to be nicer to each other. Um, because we've just gone through as a as a as a world, you know, you can take a a, a terrible event like 9/11, and that sort of strengthens for a time our interpersonal relationships for a country because it happened to us. And we there were there were people that felt for us and and you know um, um, uh, reacted in in positive ways because of that tragedy. But this is something the whole world is going through. Or you know, there's like this is a unopinionated virus, and uh, you know it 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 was just so random, like who it affects and how bad it affects them. This is something that I hope as a society we we can come together and realize that if you're a biotech company, man, democratize those proteins, democratize like the the data that you are learning about, so we can get to a solution faster. I do believe that if every biotech company gave all of the epigenetic data processing the processing that they've done and protein folding that they've done and you know all of the analysis on like the attack surface area of a cell and the injection vectors of that virus you didn't know i had a little uh, medical background did you um, uh, i believe that we'd be in a better 
better position today to, to, to be building both treatments and a potential viable vaccine. And are we going at light speed? 100% we are. Um, but through democratized access to data, could we could we do this better as a as a global society instead of you know having Moderna care about their thing and Pfizer caring about their thing and Gilead caring about their thing? I, I believe that we would be better. I would have loved to see governments come together and say, all this data is available to all governments and we're going to create this vaccine. And that would have been an incredible thing, but that's not what's happened here. I think uh, I think it goes back to um, the uh, the split between men and women, man. It's the uh, just the, the wrong people are leading these countries. There, I think there are, there are a couple of important points there. Um, you know, you mentioned you know to a certain extent feeling bad that you know Vapor IO is you know in in a better place. Um, just j- at the very least from a perception standpoint because of, you know, the pandemic and because, you know, people have looked to infrastructure as you know, solving some of the issues that have arisen. But I think in reality, and I think, you know, Nabil uh, agrees on this point, we've really just accelerated trends that were happening anyway. Um, right. So, you know, it's it's one of those things. Uh, I'm going to be a little uh, armchair. Don't feel bad about it. It's it, it's fine. We, we're, we're solving problems that exist. Um, and, and you were solving those problems anyway. But um, the idea of digital transformation being a reality and, and being accelerated in a lot of these you know organizations that, that might have been. Yeah you know, uh, avoiding or, or putting things on the back burner, you know, that's, it's, it's just one of the outcomes. But uh, no, I don't think the, the listeners need to think that uh, Cole Crawford was, was praying for a pandemic to, uh, to no, and everybody that's knows all. that, right? No, it's like, like it built into our culture, it, do well by doing good. Ben, ben, ben Franklin, um, these things were well on their My way. God, where is uh, that McEnroe Cole Crawford? Do well by doing yeah. good. Where is that guy, that brash 15-year-old that was telling everybody to F off? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you just got to give me one of my brothers, I guess. No, you're, you're, you're so right. I guess um, the problems that existed before COVID existed, and we were chipping away at those problems. Um, this certainly accelerated it, but there's always that entrepreneur's dilemma, you know, did, did I do it for reasons that were fully in my control or did it happen to me because there was a certain amount of, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a perfect world, you'd say luck, right? And I, I don't think you could say COVID was lucky, but did some external thing influence you? Did I do it or did the world do it to me? And that entrepreneur's dilemma, you're always kind of battling that, um, you know, in, in, in your mind. Um, your, friends, but I uh, your, friends, your friends, your friends, Zach and Jacob sold their company in March. If anybody is luck, uh, has, has luck, um, you know, those guys have it. Previous podcast <laughs> guests, Zach and Jacob Smith. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we love those guys. Uh, they they actually see those guys view the world like we do. Uh, they they really do. Open nineteen, baby. Open nineteen for life. Exactly. That's well, right. Switch, That's right. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, we'll get back to COVID in a minute. But uh, are you a buzzword guy? Bu- How can buzzword you ask that question? Cole Crawford this- invented the edge. Buzz, oh, like okay. I thought this was like a game show that I was like missing is, out on. It is. It is. It is a. Uh, it is a game show, but it only exists here. And <laughs> then, then, I, then, then I'm a big fan. All right. So we'll have a quick buzzword fireside. The answers are very simple. It's either real or hype. First one is artificial intelligence. Uh, it, it, am I limited to real or hype? Because context is key. I think N- narrow, narrow AI, narrow AI real machine learning real inferencing real broad ai where computers are creating skynet hype internet of things um internet of things real internet of moving things hype hyper automation i don't even know what that means hype chatbots chatbots uh i i knew a guy maybe lucky sold his company with chatbots um super narrow could be real but not very fun to use blockchain totally real now blockchain as blockchain is the foundational principles of um things like um immutability of data totally real um blockchain as the basis for even things like directed acyclic graphs totally real a blockchain is the foundation of a cryptocurrency. Mm, 
maybe some hype. Quantum computing. Totally real. Uh, early days. Early days. 5G. <laughs> well, I'm an American. We're not during burning down macro cell towers. Uh, to Yet. Yet. To Yet. Yet. To Yet. 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 To Let's totally see what happens real. on November 5th. On November 5th, <laughs> I assume those towers are coming down. Uh, totally. 5G is totally real and it does not cause cancer. Or COVID. Or, or COVID. Edge. Uh, yeah, Edge. Man, it, it's say funny, hi. you know, because we're, 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 yeah, it, it, it is. Like, it's just more internet closer to you. All right. Uh, let the record show that Cole Crawford of Vapor IO fame has said the edge is hype. The edge, the way the, the industry is trying to describe it. Yeah. So how about the empowered edge? Is that, is that like, like, uh, yeah. edge on, this, edge is, this is a, still, this is still the Gartner list that you're referencing, still right? The Gartner list, right. Yes. So he's yeah. reading a, a Gartner list of, uh, buzzwords that are going to be trendy. What? 2023. Is that, 20 that list? Yeah. 2022. I'm gonna I'm gonna go on record and say I don't think in 2023 the empowered edge is a term. I've until today I'd never even heard of it, so I'm gonna say hype. Cloud. Real, but again, if you want to know why we use the term cloud, and maybe you maybe you don't know this. The way the reason we use cloud, you remember the stencil in Visio that we'd use for things on the other side of a firewall? That was a cloud. That's why we use the term cloud. I don't know if you guys ever knew that. Um, it, like cloud is again infrastructure outside of your data center. So if you if that's like the definition you're applying to cloud, then then real. If uh, you know it's some nebulous place where the entire internet lives, then hype. I think most. I think I, I'm I'm going to guess that most people think of it as the nebulous place where the entire internet lives. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's hype. Yeah. Yeah. Net neutrality. Okay. Net neutrality. Real, but but probably not for the reasons if you're still reading Gartner that you would think. Uh, net neutrality has more to do with um, our wireline companies that are not sort of MNOs or MSOs considered Title II. So it's a it's a political real, not necessarily a technological real. Data mining. I mean, different name for something that's been around for a really long time. So the, the term, I'll say hype. But a perfect excuse to repurpose a lot of those helmets with the flashlight. 100%. <laughs> All right, last but not least, Industry 4.0. Oh, man. Again, again, a, a hype. Are we going to have billions and billions of more sensors doing things? Yes. Um, but the the macro trends and micro trends as they map to macro and microeconomics, it's just going to be the same industry we're in today. <laughs> there was no web 3.0. Right. Yeah, some of the marketing folks do a phenomenal job, don't they, creating all this marketing <laughs> hype and buzz. Well, it, dude, it's just a pendulum of IT. Like, how often does it actually change? You know, you gotta you got to be able to sell something. So... Uh, I guess you know nothing. Nothing like rebranding the same thing as a as an entirely new thing, and uh, you know making your next billion dollars. And I think that's what people don't fail to realize sometimes is that, and I, and I say this often, that the underlying infrastructure that runs um, these data centers that house these large nebulous public cloud providers are uh, leveraging the same technologies that were built in the industrial revolution: copper touching copper, glass touching glass, and you know, a large air conditioned room, some slightly more efficient than others, depending on if you put a box around it or not. If you make it really, really small, like coal is good at, it's easier to cool because there's not much, there's not a lot of moving parts going on in there. Um, it's just, uh, I, I think everybody thinks of it as, you know, some sort of space age uh, nuclear scientist totally. lab, and totally. it's just not. Um, and there's just, you know, computers on the other side of that nebulous cloud, they just happen not to be yours. Um, and they're in these rooms, many of which were built, you know, 20, 30 years ago, if not older than that, repurposed, That's right. you know, factories that, uh, That's that, right. that were built significantly before that, because they have, you know, uh, large, large uh, um, weight bearing floors, and they have large ceiling heights. And the same reason I'm you know, paying gobs and gobs of money to live in uh, Brooklyn across the river because somebody took this factory and turned it into an apartment. Damn it! Yeah, it's yeah, rude. Yeah, no, you're right. Like it, you can boil all of those all of those buzzwords that you used. You can literally will whittle down to 
the manipulation of atoms or the manipulation of bits? And is there a way to do that more efficiently? Very well said. So we live in a society where we, we are getting more and more accustomed to technology. Everything is and will be available at the fingertips. A lot of the sci-fi movies portray this dark future. We're kind of sort of living in that. Where do you think we're headed with it? I mean, is that a possibility of, that we're going to head into a dark future or do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? And the reference here to four really is the movie the Idiocracy. I don't know if you remember seeing that, but it's like one of those. Uh, actually, fun fun fact for you guys, my wife was a stand-in uh, for that movie, along with Office Space. Uh, so my wife was, yeah, part in, in, in All right, bring her in. Mike, Where is she? Judge. Bring her in. Yes, we, we, need some, we need some famous, we need some famous <laughs> people. We need to get some buzz. <laughs> she, uh, yeah, she, yeah, Mike Judge lives in Austin, actually. Um, so uh, did see the movie. I do, you know, it feels like we've come a little bit full circle back to the beginning of our conversation. Um, it's important to understand where your data is coming from. It's important to understand the interfaces that you're using to get that data. And if you are too far removed from that interface, you're never going to fully understand it. And you'll never fully be able to appreciate like why it was built in the first place. So I do, I do, I do think that, and now is it, is it, is it darker? I don't know. Um, does it create silos? 100%. We're moving to we're moving to silos of data and data lakes that exist um, in those silos, vertically integrated, but but probably, damn it, what was the term? Hyper hyper automated. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, if you know end to end perspective, like if you if you own every layer in the stack from hardware to software like you should be pretty good at automating that um so i do think that in many ways uh we're headed towards that abstraction layer does that make us dumber um as a society yes no i don't it, i don't know like <laughs> because the people that were ambivalent are still the same people that are ambivalent. You know, there's the, the people that didn't care before, the same people that don't care today. We're, there's probably just more of us that don't care. The subject matter experts, I think, are going to be fewer and, and farther between. But, you know, if you, if, you put, if you put me to sleep and I woke up, you know, 20 years into the future, you know, am I, am I, am I using, you know, Gatorade to water the lawn? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> well, we, we, we just might. <laughs> I, I, I hope. The green, you know, it's a green a, Gatorade to make it greener. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, Paul, um, oh, what's his name? Dia, Diamante, I think. Uh, do you guys know this this guy, the, the, like the um, futurist? He's a doctor. Anyway, he's, 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 uh, he was part of the um, X Prize. You guys remember the X Prize? Mm -hmm. um, foundation, uh, yeah, Peter, Peter Diamandis. I'm really sorry if, if, you're, if you if you do listen, uh, Peter, because he actually did a really cool keynote at a at an exec summit um, last year. That was really he did it by hologram, and it was really cool to experience. Um, in in that, and actually, um, I think he had open sourced the slides that he gave. He actually went through history, and he said, you know, on average. Uh, IQs are higher today than they were. Education is better than they were. We're we're fighting, you know, as a as a as a race. We're not entering into as many wars. Um, we've gotten rid of a lot of disease. I mean, he is showing that we are making progress. It's it's really easy to to look at our our society as a whole right now and say, man, you know, it was way better. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, but there's a there's another movie. Was it 50 Ways to Die in the West? Do you guys see this? Uh, who's the the Family Guy? Wait, what's that guy's name? The creator Seth of the Family Guy, Seth, Seth MacFarlane. Seth, Seth MacFarlane. He uh, it's 100 Ways to Die in the West or something. Yeah, we actually are. We're 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 better off today than we were, and I think generally people are are you're at least capable. I mean, you've got a device, right? We all have this device. If you want to. If you want to know something like the the entire knowledge of the world we are living in a knowledge economy you just have to be excited enough to go seek the answers so if i woke up my, my hope is that either through the wayback machine or you know maybe the resiliency of the internet has just gotten good enough that the answers are there 
and you know reverse engineering something if we all were to just like uh, be frozen and wake up in the future i i think would be okay what better right. words to end on than that okay there probably you probably be okay yeah, they'll probably be yeah. fine. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the pessimist I once was. Right. I feel, My God. I, I feel like I'm more of an optimist about if we asked about 17 year, If we asked 70 or 15-year-old Cole, he would have been like, oh, man, we're screwed. We're all doomed. We're screwed. We're doomed. <laughs> but I'll be the number one tennis guy. <laughs> <laughs> this was awesome. I, I really appreciate the time. some point, looking forward to, to, to wearing your shirt on a, on a, <laughs> on a stage somewhere. This has been great. Nothing lasts forever. Markets will come back, currencies will rebound, businesses will go on, and we'll all move on. That could happen next week, next month, or next year. I'm confident that those who prepare rather than panic will come out of this stronger. Thank you for joining us. This has been brought to you by Nomad Futurist. Check us online at nomadfuturist.com.